Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening. I think they're in, uh, they're in Taiwan. I'm a long way from you. I'm, I live in Ecuador, in South America, in the Pacific coast. Um, so, so it's a real pleasure to be here. And I um, and really appreciate uh, having you invited me to, the, uh, to, to your conference. So Without uh, any further ado, let's start our presentation. We are going to talk about uh, functional programming um, as, a par as a programming paradigm, as a way of coding solutions for problems. And we'll be using Kotlin specifically as our language for our examples. So, so um, uh, I ask you to focus on the concepts and on the way of thinking more than in the language itself, because many of the ideas I'm going to talk about in the following minutes can be used in other languages, uh, in other platforms, uh, even in Java itself, for, of, of course. So uh, let's get started. I've got just a few slides here. Uh, I'll start talking about um, uh, what's the difference between imperative programming and functional programming, and then, all the other slides, uh, as, as you see, it's just code examples. Code examples, so we'll, we'll be coding live here. Let's see how it goes. All righty, so um, yeah, imperative programming or the imperative uh, paradigm for uh, software development uh, is based in a couple of ideas. First of all, in the idea of commands, commands that you give a machine to be executed. For example, fetch this number from memory, uh, add these two numbers, compare these two quantities, and so on and so forth. Mostly you execute sequentially. So you do command one and then command two and command three, and then you can jump back for, uh, for sure from command five, go back to command two, and then go sequentially again. But most of the time you're going sequentially, all right? Uh, furthermore, you use state, uh, for example, memory cells or variables to store uh, the current values, the current uh, state of the system. For example, you can put here uh, the total amount of, a, of an order, right? And then it starts in zero, and then it says five, and then it says 11, and so on and so forth, okay? So you use uh, state and state changes all the time, okay? That's, that's the general idea in imperative programming. Uh, when, you, when you use imperative programming, you tell step-by-step step how to do something. It's like a recipe for cooking something, right? On the other hand, uh, when you use functional programming, you think in, for, in terms of transformations. What do I mean by that? You start with something, then you change it a little bit. Then with this change thing, you change it even more and more and more. So, uh, for example, let me go here. Where it is? You can start with this, right? then apply a first transformation and it becomes this and apply uh, another transformation and it becomes this and uh, so on. So you eventually end up with the thing that you want, that you need, all right? When you think in terms, in that terms, uh, you are working functionally. You are using the functional uh, paradigm. In this other way of working, it's interesting that you don't have the state that you are changing. It's just, it's just the input value that goes transforming through functions. So you've got function one here, and then function one, two here, function three here, and so on, that uh, goes transforming the initial value. And there's no external state. There is no such a thing as an me external memory area where you go changing stuff. This you don't do when you're doing uh, functional programming. 
So here, instead of saying how to do step-by-step -step things, what you say is what you want to finally get, right? So I finally want to get here, and from here, I have to transform things to finally get something in the shape I finally want. It's more declarative if you want. So that's, that's the difference with, with this, these two ways of thinking. And all of this could, could uh, look uh, kind of uh, abstract. So let's start with the specific examples. For example, let's say, let's say we, we've got a list of numbers, three, one, minus two, minus five, and I want to add them. All right. If you think in terms of uh, imperative programming, probably many of you are thinking, ah, oh, I have to start with a, say, total variable. If that variable starts with zero, then I'm going to do a loop, and the loop adds three to the total, and then one to the total, and, and then minus two to the total, and so on. And total is the state. And you, step by step, make the state row up until the final, uh, the final uh, answer or result, right? That, that would be imperative. What if we want to do this um, uh, functionally? So let me start Kotlin right here, right? I'm going, to, I'm going to create a new project starting from zero, right? So what I'm going to say is, uh, for example, uh, on Kotlin, okay, this is going to be my project. I'm going to create it. All right, let's give just one sec to my machine. Here we are. And this is the start of I, and let me also sort of that. Make this bigger. Here we are, right? So this is, uh, this is my, uh, my uh, Kotlin program, right? Which, by the way, it compiles to a jar file and it's totally compatible with Java, meaning that you, call, you can call any Java method from Kotlin. And on the other hand, you can uh, call from Kotlin, uh, a, well, I said before, <laughs> sorry about that. From here in Kotlin, you can call any Java method but on the other hand, from Java code, for, from any class in Java, you can call Kotlin methods. So they are totally interoperable, right? Uh, in any case, I wanted to start with, uh, uh, as I said before, with a list of values. So uh, uh, let's, uh, for example, here we are. We are creating uh, numbers, which is a list with these values. And if we want to add them, what we do is something like this. Salt uh, equals, let's uh, the, leave out all of this sum. And that's it. That's pretty much it. And probably you may be thinking that I'm cheating because I'm using a, a function, right? But, uh, what we are doing here is getting this initial thing and using a function to transform it in something else, right? If you want to see it as a, as a picture, let's get here. What we are doing, what we are doing is we are starting with an array, uh, three, one, minus two, five, right? And through a function, we are transforming it in a value, minus four, if I'm not mistaken, right? So let's just uh, run, just to see how it goes. Run it, uh, it's going to compile, and we'll get the final value. Just a sec. All right. Now, uh, this is simple enough, and we've got minus three. Sorry about that, I made a small mistake. So it's minus three, the answer to this question. So 
What about if I just want to add the positive numbers, right? So I want to filter this list. And instead of using all of the numbers, I want to use just these two numbers, right? In this case, what I want to do is uh, before adding the numbers, check out what I'm going to write here. I'm going to create a second thing on the way, just get three and five, and then get the four. So now I'm going to use two functions. First, the F function to get the, uh, the second list, and then the, uh, another function to finally get the value I want, All right? So how we do that? I'm going to get here. First of all, I'm going to uh, express the function I want to use. For example, in my case, uh, fun uh, positive, let's call it like this. Like this. So the positive function gets an integer, an argument, and what it does is it returns true or false, right? Okay, so now what we're going to do is to, uh, let's, let's, you know, comment this first line. Okay. Just, uh, just to see what's going on here. And here, what we're going to say is, I want to filter data. And uh, what I'm going to use as filter is that positive function. Right? So check out what's going on here. I start with the numbers. Then I use this function. I use this function to uh, create this intermediate result. And then I sum, right? So let's see now the, the result. And now we are getting four, right? So probably some of you, uh, if you think about the imperative way of doing things, you would think in terms of, uh, I need the total variable and I need a loop. And inside the loop, I want, I need an if branch, if then else, you know, and we are not using any of that. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and say that now I want to add up the squares of the numbers. So what I want to do is to add three squared plus one squared plus minus two squared and so on and so forth. In other, in other words, what I would now want to do is once again, start with three, one, minus two, five, right? Then apply a first transformation and get nine, one, four, 25, all right? And then add them up. And I think we're going to get 39 there, all right? So let's see how we do that, okay? Remember that we want to do First of all, this first transformation here, right? Okay, a transformation that goes from one list to another list, right? So let's create this other function, okay? Found a square, we get the x, and all we do is just to, you know, square the number. Right? So now what we're going to do is, uh, Start with the numbers, and the function with now that I want to use is the function that goes by the name of map, right? So check out what's going to happen here. Map, um, excuse me, square. And what map does, it's uh, really interesting. What map does is apply this function square function to each and every one of the numbers, right? And then add them up. Is it working? Once again, we got 39, right? And um, we're doing this. And of course we can combine everything. For example, I can get the filtering here and put it here, 
right? So we start with the numbers. We create a new list just with the positive numbers. Then we square those numbers, just the positive ones, and then we finally add them up, right? See it uh, working again. And we get 10, right? Which is probably three square squared plus one squared, right? So as you can see, uh, for the question of given a list, add up the squares of only the positive numbers in, the, in that list, what you do is a sequence of transformations. No loops, no variables, no state. Here you are thinking functionally. Now, just as a matter, just as a matter of notation, let's let's work a little bit with this. All right. So this is in principle a final solution, but I'm going to do something like this. Uh, it turns out that if you want to, for example, filter the numbers, see, uh, you have to create the positive function. But if I want, uh, for example, the even numbers, you have to create a second function. If you want only the numbers bigger than 100, you need a third function and so on and so forth. And you would end up creating a lot of small functions. So what you can do, what you can do is to create on the flight filter the function like this, right? Check out what we are doing here. We're using filter just as we did before, but instead of uh, saying that I want to use this predefined function, what I'm doing here is defining right here in line 12, we are defining the function, right? The notation is pretty similar to what you use in, in languages like JavaScript. This is a function with just one parameter, x, and what we return is uh, this Boolean here, right? So we filter the numbers with this function, and then we add, we add them up. Of course, the answer should be just the same. Furthermore, furthermore, here we have the four. Furthermore, in Kotlin, when the last parameter is a function, you can you can uh, ignore you can leave out the parentheses. So you can write this like this, right? And it's exactly the same what we did before, right? So so much so that, that uh, maybe let me leave this here, right? Okay, just to remember. That this, this is just an abbreviation, right? And this, again, does, does exactly the same, right? And we are going to get a four once again here, right? All right. So uh, we, can, we can finally get the whole result got here. All right, let's get it here and let's... Uh, Say, for example, I want to filter, you know, and my filter is uh, x, where x is uh, bigger than zero. It's the first thing. And then I want to transform it, mapping it. And what I want to do is for every y, for example, what I want to do is to return y, right? And this is going to do exactly the same without using these, uh, these predefined functions, right? Furthermore, of course, this is a parameter and you can use any name you want, but the suggested name is IT, right? Okay, this is just a convention. Use the IT name here for the parameter, could be anything, but you'll see a trick in a minute. So, first of all, Let's see, uh, let's see this working just to check out. This should give us the four once again. All right. 
and uh, it is working. It is working, all right? But it so happens that when your parameter has got the name IT, you can leave it out, right? So let me just uh, show it here. So you can just leave out this part when the parameter name is IT, right? This is just uh, a small convention and it makes you write things uh, in a far more compact way, right? Run it once again. There we go. All right. And just as a final step, this is again just a small convention, when you are first transforming everything with this and then adding up stuff, so what you can do is you mix both things with the sum of function, all right? All we are doing here is just uh, uh, collapsing in just one function. Remember, sum of is a function. This two calls here, all right? And finally, once again, we can see that We've got the solution, get a list of numbers and just add up the squares of only the positive ones in a very compact way, like here, right? No variables, no loops, no ifs. This is functional programming, all right? So now let's go on, let's go on. And uh, uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is what about when we want to work with objects, all right? With complex things, like for example, persons that got names and ages and countries. And what I want to do, for example, is good to get the average age of all the people, right? So let's go there, let's go back here. And what I'm going to do uh, is, uh, to define a data class, right? Like for example, a person, right? So let me just get down this a little bit here. So here is how the one way of defining a class in Kotlin, okay? In this case, the person class, and every person has got a name and an age and a country. And then of course you are going to create uh, uh, you're going to create uh, uh, objects of this class, right? As you can see, it, this is very compact, right? Uh, so let me define another function, this one here, right? So the get people function returns a list of persons. And what we do is we create a list with this first person, Santiago, age 36 from Ecuador, and then Pierre from France, and then Alejandra from Ecuador, right? Uh, uh, list with three people, right? Okay, so now down here, down here, what we can do is to exactly create the people variable, okay, call it a function, right? And then what if we want to add up the ages of these people, right? So now we, what we want to do here is a little bit more complicated, just a little bit, right? So we start with uh, three people. It's got a number of properties here, name, age, country. And then through a first transformation, I want to keep just the ages, uh, 36 and uh, 29 and 21, for example. And then we get the average, all right? First transformation, second transformation, right? How do we do that? Uh, what we can do here is to say, start with people and first of all, map it. Once again, we're going to create a map, right? And this first map does exactly this transformation here. 
this transformation. Each object is transformed in just one number. Each full object is transformed in just one number. All right? That's what we do with this map here. All right? So now here we've got just a list of numbers, the ages, and then we average them. Right? So let's check it out. Compile it. And we've got the average, 32 years in my example. All right? Once again, once again, we are expressing in just one line what we want to get. But uh, now let's get a little bit ambitious. And what about this? What about if we want to find out the, uh, excuse me, the average age for the people from Ecuador, in this case, Santiago and Alejandra. And then the average age from the people of uh, France, in this case, just Pierre and uh, his age, all right? And so now what we are going to create is a second list. And this is an, an interesting one. Let's go step by step. What we are doing here is where we are starting with our list, right? And the list has got three items, three objects, all right? And now what we are going to get is, pay attention to these two groups. The first group, Ecuador, all right? That's got two items. Okay, and a second group for France that has got one item, all right? This is getting complicated. What we're going to do is to use a function that goes from this list here to this other list. And this list has got two elements, two groups. Each element has got a key like Ecuador or France and values like this list and this list. This looks really complicated. Let's try it out, right? So let me go back here, right? And what I'm going to say here is I want the result, start with people, and what I want to do is to group it. By what? By IP country, right? This transformation here, this transformation here does exactly what I illustrated here, right? Let's see it working, going step by step. So what I'm doing here is first of all, as you can see down here, We've got one object. This object has got Ecuador as a first value, as a, and then this list. This list has got two people there, all right? And then down here, we've got France, and France has got this list here, all right? So now we've got it grouped. Uh, for example, let's, let's just think that what I want is to see um, the name, uh, how many items I've got in every group. Two people in the Ecuador group, one person in the, uh, in the France group. Can do is then map it, okay, and say what I want is IT size, all right? What I'm doing here, what I'm doing here is, uh, give me just a second, excuse me. Uh, is, uh, uh, the country, excuse me. Well, let's start here, right? All right, 
So let's uh, let's start here. And then you see we've got just Ecuador and France. What we did here, first we grouped things and then we made a mapping. And what we did is to go from here right, and go to just the numbers, uh, excuse me, just the names, Ecuador and France. This is my second transformation, okay? That's what we did here. Or, for example, instead, we can say, no, 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 no. What I want is values, and what I want is the size, right? In this case, instead of, instead of going here, we're going to the values two and one here, right? So let's, let's check out this working. And we've got two and one element, right? And then this is interesting because instead of two and one, just counting the values here, what I want to do is to find out the average of the ages. So what we can do here is to take the values, right? And do this inside here, right? So what we are doing is to get, check out this value is this part, all right? And this part. To take this part, get just the ages for that part, for example, 36 and 29, all right? And then average it to uh, 32.5, right? So this thing here, is to get in the value, all right? And this thing here is uh, mapping it to age and then average, all right? That's what we are doing inside here. Let's see if it works. And it worked, 32.5 and 31, all right? Generate groups, and then each group, each group, each individual group is transformed using this. For each group, in the first group, I get the values, that, that is the four people, five people, or whatever number of people we've got it there, and uh, map it, all right, and then get just the ages of the people for the group, and then average the ages for the people of the first group, and then do the same in the second group, and the third group, and the fourth group, and so on and so forth. We are almost there. We are almost there, right? Uh, because what we wanted is to have the uh, the um, country names here. Remember what I wanted to do is to get Ecuador and the average, France and the average, and so on and so forth. So how do we do that? What we do that is doing this, okay? I'm going to make it a little bit longer, right? So, you start with the groups, and then what, what I'm going to do is for every group, we are going to create a pair. Here we are. Probably I'm going to put this in two lines to make it more understandable. So let's go here. Start with uh, all the people, then we create groups for every country, two groups or three groups or whatever it is. And every group is, generates a pair of, uh, of values. For every group, what I do is I, cre I create a pair. The first element of the pair is the key, Ecuador, France, and so on. 
And the second element is what we did before, right? Get the values, that is the two people in the group, get the ages of those two people, and then average them, okay? Let's see if, if this works. Uh, what did I do wrong here? Let me see map value average. Ah, excuse me. Something funny here. Okay, there we go. So uh, let's uh, let's one again compile this. Okay. So about that, uh, run it. Let's run it. There we go. All right, and here it is finally. We've got Ecuador with an average age of 32.5, and then we've got France with the average age of 31, okay? And yes, probably this is kind of hard to understand at first, okay? But uh, first, let me point out that we are going really fast right now. We're going at full speed here, right? And uh, we are doing a really kind of complex transformation, the one down here. All right. From here, right? So we are doing already very complicated stuff. And once again, we are using no variables, no for loops, no ifs, no anything. Right, this is a um, this is a really uh, interesting thing. Okay, um, finally, finally, if you know that this this is what you want to do, you want to do, then you can alternatively write it uh, this way. A simpler way of writing the same. Uh, what I'm saying here, let me put again this in two lines. All right. And what I'm doing down here, let me let me just call this result once again. So just to make things simpler. Okay. It's grouping by uh, the country. And then we are collapsing all this thing here, the pairs and things like that, in just one function. We say, you know, for every group that's made by a country and the list of people in that country, that's every group, okay? Every group has got these two things. Remember my graph here, up here, this one. This one here, we, every group has got a key and a list of values like here. All right, this is one group. And for every group, what we want to do is to get the values and then just keep the ages and average them, right? So this is a more compact way of writing Almost the same thing here, right? Let's see it working. And there you go. Once again, this is just an abbreviation, just an abbreviation of the general idea that we've got here, right? So to sum up and to end up here, let's get more ambitious. And what about if we've got this other structure? This is a typical list of orders. Every order has got an, excuse me, an order ID and a customer name. And then inside of the order, we've got a list of details, right? Like uh, this first detail here and this second detail here, right? The next order has got a customer and then there's details. And the next order has got a customer and then the details, all right? And let's say 
that now what we want to do is to adapt all of the values for all of the orders, all right? So what, what I want to do is to multiply the unit price by the quantity, right? And uh, let's quickly do it, right? All I'm going to do here is to create this uh, first data class detail, all right? With the product name and the and the uh, unit price and the quantity, and then an order is uh, just uh, an order ID, a customer, and a list of details. All right, and then let's create a small uh, function, get uh, orders, for example. All right, which is going to create a list of uh, order, precisely. Right, and uh, just to save you for me, uh, for me writing stuff, let's quickly write this here. Give me just a second. Here we are. All right, we are just returning these orders. All right, and uh, excuse me. Here we go. All right, so let's go down here. And uh, what we're going to do is create orders and to add them up, what we are going to do is say something like this. All right, so we're going to group the items, then use the map values, we just use it here. Um, for every order, we're getting the details for that order and then adding up the unit price, right? Uh, let's run this. And we have here that John has a total of $19 in its order, and Mary has a total of $5 in its order. And once again, even though now we are doing something really complicated, because what we are doing here is to get the details from John, these two details here and these other two details down here, and then adding them up and doing the same for Mary and then for Michael and then for Pierre. Uh, we solved that problem with just two lines. All right, so this is the general idea of functional programming using functions to start from some uh, original value and then apply transformations to get to the final value we can we want to get. Uh, this is what I wanted to show you right now. So now I think I don't know if we got if we still we've got time, and if we got it, that would be great to uh, to if you've got any questions.